So uh, I will present now on the Lutheran viewpoint uh, to begin with. Uh, in terms of the Lutheran viewpoint, it's often been described by a term consubstantiation. I'll define that. Uh, I, I want to say that I hold in here to a real presence in you, and by real presence, real is, is kind of short for corporeal or bodily presence, which will distinguish my viewpoint a bit from the reform you'll hear in just a moment. So the term uh, consubstantiation uh, arises initially as uh, attributed to kind of the thought of Luther. He didn't use that term. Uh, see, he was in with and under that if, it, if there's two substances, they're present with each other. Uh, now, it's, consubstantiation is differentiated from transubstantiation, which is Roman Catholic teaching, uh, which would be that the, uh, the, the bread and the cup remain in the form of bread and cup, though their substances have, in fact, been transformed into the real body and blood of Jesus. Uh, it's, it's Thomas Aquinas drawing from Aristotelian philosophy, and Luther would have none of that. Uh, so he comes back just to say simply, though it's a mystery, there's two substances that are really present in the elements. Uh, the body present corporeally in uh, the bread, the blood present corporeally in the wine. The whole body of Christ is present in any element, in any piece of the bread. The whole blood of Christ is contained in any little drop of, uh, of the wine. And so uh, Luther's image, uh, he, he refers to this union, as it were, as a red-hot iron. Uh, the Babylonian captivity of the church, he says, why could not Christ include his body in the substance of the bread just as well as in its form? In a red-hot iron, for example, the two substances, fire and iron, are so mingled that every part is both iron and fire. Why should not be even more possible that the glorious body of Christ be contained in every part of the substance of bread? Uh, so, a helpful image, uh, unless you're a physics major, and then it probably falls apart. <laughs> but the idea that uh, that there's a, there's a kind of joining of two substances together in a sense, using uh, the language of the So what I want to do, I'd like to give you three sort of lines of reasoning. First comes from interpretation, briefly, uh, to go through a little bit of scripture, the words of Jesus himself, uh, and how that was taken in church history, starting with the Apostle Paul and moving forward. Secondly, uh, to take a look at Christology, the person and work of Christ, and, uh, and how this seems to indicate that uh, the real presence, corporeal presence of Christ in the elements is preferred. And finally, to talk about the practice in terms of worship. Uh, that, the, uh, that these are a means of grace. Uh, and thus, getting into a sort of remembrance, uh, although a bit more than that. So first, in terms of interpretation, you can see from Matthew and Mark, uh, this is Luther's kind of go-to uh, in the Marburg uh, discussion uh, to, to really emphasize this is what the text says. Uh, the plain sense here of the gospel text um, in Matthew, this is my body, this is my blood, uh, same thing in Mark. Luke and Corinthians uh, still have this is my body and the cup is the new covenant in my blood. Uh, but the plain sense of these uh, as as Luther would, would say, is to simply take it at face value. Uh, that there's no sort of symbolic language here or parabolic language. Uh, but as he says in, again, Babylon captivity, both remain there together, and it's truly said, this bread is my body, this wine is my blood, and vice versa. Thus I will for now understand it for the honor of the holy words of God, which I will not allow any petty human argument to override or give to the meanings foreign to them. Uh, very much Luther. <laughs> so uh, the plain sense if it was merely a symbol uh, then, then certainly the Passover was an adequate symbol in fact the last supper, supper is a Passover meal itself uh, if there's some sort of parabolic or metaphorical meaning uh, it seems that Jesus might be a bit more clear on it and especially if you incorporate the John 6 passage uh, that that Dr. Grieber mentioned, whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him, John 6, 56. Uh, getting at the real the union with Christ that is uh, signified there. And so uh, while it is 
not a direct um, exegetical uh, find there's a bit of interpretation there. Uh, partaking of the real corporeal presence of Jesus would be the plain sense of this Jesus. Now, Paul could be argued to, to make this case in 1 Corinthians. Uh, in chapter 10, verse 16, he talks about the Lord's Supper as a participation or fellowship in the body, in the blood of Jesus. Now, this gets at the reality of the union of Jesus and the believer, that, that of which uh, the Lord's Supper is a sign. Uh, he also, as he talks about the warning against judgment, he says, if you eat without discerning the body, or uh, as, as Vidak, the Greek English lexicon, translates this word, the acrino, recognize. So to say, Paul is arguing here for the judgment is coming because they do not recognize the body present in the elements. It's not discerned clearly. And so the plain sense interpretation would reason that the body must be recognized because it is really, that is corporeally, there. It's bodily there. The uh, corporeal presence of of, uh, of Christ in the elements is also the view uh, as you look through church fathers. Uh, so Justin Martyr, we call this food the Eucharist. No one's allowed to partake of it except him who believes that our teachings are true and has been cleansed in the bath for forgiveness of his sins and for his regeneration. He lives as Christ commanded, not as common bread or as common drink we receive, but just as through the word of God, Jesus Christ our Savior became incarnate and took on flesh and blood for our salvation. So we've been taught the food over which thanks has been given by the power of his word, which nurtures our flesh and blood by assimilation, is both the flesh and blood of that incarnate Jesus. And the emphasis on the incarnation, the physicality, the, the carnage of it. We move on uh, a bit. Irenaeus, the bread from the earth, receiving the invocation of God, is no more common bread, but Eucharist, consisting of two realities, an earthly and a heavenly. Clement of Alexandria, the blood of the Lord is twofold. There's the blood of his flesh, as wine is blended with water. The mixture of both is called Eucharist. And so it is a mixture of these two. Uh, and finally, uh, in this little sampling, Cyril of Jerusalem, do not think that the elements is mere bread and wine. They are, according to the Lord's declaration, body and blood. Though the perception suggests the contrary, let faith be your stay. Instead of judging matters by taste, let faith give you an unwavering confidence that you have been privileged to receive the body and blood of Christ. And my favorite argument, he once changed water into wine at Canaan and Galilee at his own will. And shall we not believe him when he changes wine into blood? And so this, this seems to be, uh, if we take the, uh, the viewpoint of the early church, the apostles' successors, uh, the quotations help demonstrate that the early church held to the elements as mysteriously containing the body and blood of Christ uh, that could be received bodily. If we explore the personal work of Christ, uh, I'm going to argue that they confirm this interpretation. In the incarnation, uh, the person of Jesus, the eternal Son of God, became united to the human person, Jesus, such that Jesus Christ is truly God and truly human. Jesus is Emmanuel, or God with us. Uh, Calcivant says that he's truly God, truly man, a reasonable soul and body, consubstantial, consubstantial with the Father according to the Godhead, and consubstantial with us according to the manhood. He goes on to say uh, he's the only begotten to be acknowledged in two natures, inconfusedly, unchangeably, indivisibly, inseparably. The distinction of natures being by no means taken away by the union. But rather, the property of each nature is preserved, concurring in one person, one subsistence, not parted or divided into two persons, but one and the same same. So his humanity, his divinity, cannot be divided. One implication of the incarnation is the significance of our bodies. If our Lord took on a human body and was raised in a resurrected human body, then bodies are important to speak of. Our bodies are important, and the Lord's body is important, and things like eating and drinking become important, like for the glory of God in 1 Corinthians 10.35. Without the corporeal presence of Jesus in the elements, we risk losing some of the significance of the incarnation. 
words are saying that Jesus still is bodily present, not just spiritually, just as he didn't come, uh, just spiritually, but bodily in the incarnation. He is bodily present for us still. And so, uh, in this sense, the, the memorial viewpoint, the reform viewpoint, uh, cannot emphasize the significance of the incarnation uh, in a corporeal sense like the corporeal viewpoint. We can. We look at the crucifixion. Uh, Luther said the Lord's Supper must be tied to the crucifixion because the Lord's Supper is the testament, as in last will and testament. The promise of the testator, when giving a testament, is made by giving a sacramental sign. The testator is about to die and is leaving an inheritance. The inheritance promised is the forgiveness of sins uh, for many and for you. As he says, again, in Babylon captivity. So you see what we call Lord's Supper is a promise of the forgiveness of sins made to us by God. And such a promise has been confirmed by the death of the Son of God. For a promise and a testament differ only in that a testament involves the death of the one who makes it. Now God made a testament. Therefore it was necessary that he should die. But God could not die unless he became a human. Thus the incarnation and the death of Christ are both to be understood as being in this one enormously rich word, testament. Finally, the resurrection. And I think this is where the major challenge of the corporeal viewpoint comes in. How is Jesus' human body and blood present in bread and wine? The answer lies in Jesus' resurrected body. In Jesus' resurrected body, he is seemingly not restricted by time and space as our human bodies are. For example, John 20, verse 19. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them. He's there. John 20, verse 26, again, with Thomas this time. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them. Luke 24, on the road to Emmaus. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing them. Uh, from recognizing him, excuse me. While he was at the table with them, after he was explaining the scriptures to them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. Interesting enough, he can vanish. Our human bodies can't vanish. Although some of you on test days wish that they could. <laughs> but Jesus' resurrected body could vanish. Now also, notice that they recognize Jesus when he broke the bread, and then he is no longer visibly present with them. Uh, the end of that story says they, they went and told what happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. And I think that's a powerful story if, if you interpret it in such a way as being a sort of uh, model for what uh, the Lord's Supper is. Jesus is known and recognized bodily in his resurrected body. Although a mystery, his resurrected body has taken on thus a type of omnipresent. Uh, omnipresence. Uh, if I can read uh, briefly from uh, a Lutheran on Lord's Supper 5 views book, uh, he says this, while Jesus will eternally possess true human body and soul, he assumed in Mary's womb at the Annunciation, we must not straitjacket his unique sacred manhood according to limits encountered in regular human experience. For one thing, his soul and body subsist in a personal or hypostatic union with the eternal Son of God. For another, his humanity enjoys a real communion with his divinity, being, as it were, a bar of iron in the firmness of Godhead. And third, divine properties or attributes are communicated to Jesus' human nature, including the divine majesty which enables him as a man to know and have power over all things, and, interestingly, to be present as and where he is. Though it's a mystery, uh, he is present bodily in bread and in cup. So therefore, how do we enter into worship? To enter into the mystery of, of uh, the Lord's Supper, Worship by the word. Jesus Christ's words uh, institutes a sacramental sign, and his death grants the inheritance. Uh, as Luther uses Psalm 107 20, he set forth his word and thus healed him. The word is primary. Uh, it's through faith. These truths are known in the word and received by faith, as Romans 10 17. Faith from hearing, hearing from the word of Christ. 
It's a means of grace, a sacramental sign, not magic in and of itself, rather a means of receiving the grace of God purchased for us in the incarnation, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's a guarantee. The bread and cup, body and blood, are signs of God's forgiveness. They point forward to the great marriage feast of the Lamb in Revelation, which is the true inheritance, union with Christ as his bride. For now, it's a meal that nourishes faith and sustains. as a mysterious partaking of Jesus Christ himself, the body and blood of Jesus, it signifies our union already achieved by his incarnation, death, and resurrection. So, one or two questions. Yes. That's the mystery of it. That's the mystery of it. And yet, um, if I could say, how is the eternal Son of God present in a human being, a body? I mean, that itself is a mystery as well, and that's one that we have accepted as, as Christians. I mean, in Luther form, he said, you tell me how the God and man are united in the person of Jesus Christ, and I'll tell you how the bread and and body are united in the altar. That's, uh, that's the Luther version. But, but I say, yes, it's a mystery, just like the Incarnation. Um, and so uh, it, it certainly is a mystery. And yet, uh, to look at the resurrection and say that Jesus has taken on a sort of omnipresence uh, means that he could be both seated at the right hand of the Father and present bodily in his humanity and divinity in bread and juice. Yes. Other question? Please. Uh, I'm thinking about what Josh said here, which is really important. Uh, the, the thing about it being a Paschal feast, a Paschal feast, <clears throat> I forget who I was reading, but it was going through John 6, whether or not that applies to this. But the idea that, you know, in Judaism, the sacrifice of the man, you're going to eat the sacrifice. So I mean, it's, it's Jesus. For the sake of time, please help me introduce um, Dr. Goldberg. Well,